Coming up, she's a woman of impact. A porch band council member gets a big award. Plus... It was one of those things that, like, for any reporter in the building who was, like, watching it, was just shocked. We learn what piece of legislation in New Mexico almost made it across the finish line to become a law. And Oscar nominee Lily Gladstone shares a bit of her Blackfeet language. We have those interviews, plus headlines ahead on the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people. Support for the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Awahopa. Thank you for joining us. I am Aliyah Chavez. We start today in the Great Lakes, where there is broad support from various tribal nations for an effort to stop an oil and gas pipeline. 30 tribal leaders sent a letter this week to the Biden administration, urging it to speak out against the Enbridge Line 5 pipeline. A federal judge ruled last year that the Canadian pipeline trespasses on the lands of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. That ruling is under appeal. The tribes want the administration to support the Bad River tribe and tribal sovereignty. It's very important that this administration acknowledge and honor tribal sovereignty because its decisions here in the Bad River Bands case will have implications on the sovereignty of all tribal nations. Moving to Alaska, shooting that has left two dead has shocked a remote community. Last week, an Inupiat 16-year-old allegedly shot and killed two people and injured two others. This is in the rural whaling village of Point Hope. North Slope Borough Police found the bodies and those injured at a local home. Witnesses say the teen entered with a handgun and began shooting. The shooter has been charged with two counts, each a first-degree murder and attempted murder. Bail was set at $1 million and requiring a third-party custodian for his release. According to Alaska state law, minors 16 and older can be tried in adult court for murder charges. Earlier this week, the Biden administration announced funding for renewable energy on tribal lands. $366 million will pay for 17 solar, battery storage, and hydropower projects across the U.S. This comes after the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission gave tribes the authority to block hydropower projects on their lands. The funding comes from a $1 trillion infrastructure law that President Joe Biden signed in 2021. Projects will span across 20 states and involve 30 tribes. Sherry Smith, president of the nonprofit Alliance for Tribal Clean Energy, says these announcements build hope for communities. Turning to the Midwest, a prominent organization on women's issues has a new leader. ICT Shirley Snavy reports. Ruthanna Buffalo is the new CEO of the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center. She is a former North Dakota state legislator and chairs the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center has a long history of advocacy in the community and providing services to women and children. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to partnering and building with the community and the staff members and of course the board. <laughs> The Minnesota-based nonprofit supports women and families with services while advocating for justice and equity. Definitely see it being a very important key role in working with the tribal nations of Minnesota, for sure. Um, Minneapolis-St. Paul has one of the larger populations of natives um, in the country, so definitely Lots of issues to address, um, including the intersections of our missing and murdered Indigenous peoples, for sure. Shirley Snavy, ICT News. 
Well, a Washington state man is pleading guilty for his role in killing in a killing spree of thousands of eagles. Federal prosecutors say Travis John Branson killed more than 3,000 birds and eagles on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Branson, along with others, allegedly sold feathers and other parts of the eagles on the black market. According to a federal study, illegal shootings are the leading cause of death for golden eagles, which are birds birds that are sacred to tribes nationwide. Under an agreement with prosecutors, Branson will plead guilty to reduced charges for conspiracy, wildlife trafficking, and two counts of unlawful trafficking of eagles. A council member for the Porch Band of Creek Indians has been recognized for her work. Yellow Hammer News honors Sandy Hollinger for her unwavering commitment to her tribe. Shirley Snavy has more for us. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for letting me, allowing me to um, move the meeting time. Um, we had a tribal elder to pass away and um, um, I sing um, and uh, so I get asked to sing it many funerals. Um, so uh, she was 96 years old and um, um, her request before passing was to have me sing in, in certain songs. So I just felt like I needed to do that. And that's probably one of the reasons why you were named a woman of impact because you care so much about your band members. I do. Um, you know, I'm very passionate about um, people in general and, you know, moving us forward. And, um, and I'm, you know, I, I was raised in church and everything and I have a, I'm really faith-based and I just have a heart uh, to help people and encourage people. And so whatever I can do to help families in need or, or, you know, just anything that it, within my power that I can help, that's me. That's who I am. So tell me a little bit about yourself. So I, I started to work with um, the tribe in 2004, and um, I worked a few different positions. My last position before becoming a council member was um, in family services um, intake coordinator. And um, so there I helped assist with low income families and, you know, with their needs and things like that. And then I just had a heart's desire that I wanted to do something else for our tribe. I wanted to do try something different, you know, and with my helping heart. Um, so I decided, you know, hey, I want to run for tribal council. And um, so I first ran in 2011 and I was elected and I've been a council member since then. Um, I am enjoy doing what I do. But, you know, I love being in the decision making to move our tribe forward financially um, and policy making for our tribe um, and just, you know, being there and helping our tribal members. But it's yeah. not all fun and games. I know you guys have some tough issues, don't you? We do have some um, tough days, some tough decisions to make at times. Um, no, ma'am, it's not always easy. Uh, you know, some things can be challenging. And of course, you know, Sometimes you get a pat on the back and then sometimes you're say, you know, you get asked, uh, well, why did you vote like that? And, you know, why do you think like that? So, of course, you know, you have to um, stand by your decision and explain sometimes why you vote the way you do and all. But we have um, we've grown and we have a beautiful casino here in the, you know, the middle of the tribe. And um, we we've, we've got new buildings, a new help department. We have a, an assisted living for elders, um, a cell center. Uh, we have a boys and girls club that um, we provide a lot of care for our, our children and, um, you know, homework club and summer programs and after school program. And we pick our children up from local schools, um, I think for seven different schools in the afternoon and bring them to the Boys and Girls Club. So we have over 500 children involved in our program there. And it's a, very, a really big program. Um, so, you know, we we try our best as leaders to provide different benefits to our tribal members, our tribal families um, to help us grow forward. Don't you guys have like an amusement park or something like that? Yes, ma'am, we do. Um, it's in Foley, Alabama. It's uh, near uh, the beach area here. Um, it's called Owa, 
which stands for, stands for water. Um, but we do have an amusement park there and we have a water park. Um, we have one hotel there and then we're um, in the process of building another hotel there. Um, it does well. And so we're proud of that. Um, so I love that. Um, so you guys are kind of like a destination tourism place. Yes, ma'am, we are. And of course, um, you know, we have Wind Creek Casino. Um, that's our brand um, here at the tribe. And then we've got several throughout the nation. We've got a couple in the Caribbean islands. But um, here, um, you know, in our in our small rural community, uh, we have Wind Creek here at Atmore, the Atmore branch. And it is, you know, it's a destination resort. Um, so uh, it has a theater and a bowling alley in it. Um, a spa, um, a cooking studio, you know, so it, it's it's a place where, you know, it's just not gambling. You can bring your family and, um, you know, during the summer we have concerts outside and, you know, that allows some fun time, family time. And, you know, so, yeah, we're very proud. Sounds to me like you must have had wonderful parents. I, I have a wonderful, strong tribal mom. She's 86 years old. Um, my dad, I have a twin brother. My dad passed away when we were two years old. He had a massive heart attack. So mom, you know, raised us as a single mom. And, you know, we we know what it's like not to have much at all, you know, and but she worked to provide for us. And, um, and you know, she always taught us that, you know, to believe and to, you know, pray. And our community is a faith-based community. And so she instilled in me and in us, the children to, to always, you know, do the best that you can do and, and be what you can be and love like you want others to love you. And so she instilled in me, um, those traits and I'm forever grateful for that and I am so thankful to still have her here by my side today. When we ate indigenous foods, wild rice, berries, nuts, fish, and wild game, we did not experience diabetes or obesity. Nowadays, children across the U.S. eat too many empty calories and drink sugar-sweetened beverages. Our Native families suffer more with the lack of access to fresh, nutritious foods. I want to be it in prevention. Teaching knowledge and skills at a young age. Our baby's first feedings are so important. This practice of eating well to nourish our body, it's learned by the time our babies turn to. Teaching family spirit I can see knowledge and skills taking root. We want our children to get the benefits of breast milk, nurse as long as possible, then learn to eat healthy and avoid soda pop and eat fresh foods. I'm teaching this program called Family Spirit Nurture. It's a home visiting program created by and for Native people that promotes nutritional health for parents and their children. It really helps our young caregivers with practical skills and makes a difference. Family Spirit Nurture's six lessons are just what new parents need to know about nutrition for babies and young children. We teach parents how to know when infants are hungry and full, how and when to start solid foods. We help parents figure out how to create sleep schedules and plan meals. Lessons focus on sugar moderation and healthy eating. Family Spirit Nurture has been proven an effective strategy for promoting healthy infant feeding and growth in the first year of life. Based on demand, the Family Spirit team at the Johns Hopkins Center for Indigenous Health is making Family Spirit Nurture available for any community to adopt. I would encourage others to bring Family Spirit Nurture to their people. My vision of our community is that we have these babies growing up healthy, overall, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. We're going to have these beautiful kids living that good life and having the value system our ancestors meant for us to practice.
Language revitalization is a priority for many tribes across Turtle Island. It's what ties them to their sense of place and identity. Almost 10 million people identify as American Indian or Alaska Native, but only a quarter of a million speak their indigenous language. ICT wants to do its part in perpetuating the beauty of these native languages. That's why we've added a regular feature to the newscast. Today, we turn to Academy Award nominee nominee Lily Gladstone for a peek at her journey to better understand her Blackfeet language. I'm from the Blackfeet Nation, um, Fish Eater Clan through a Kainai Nation, and also Nimipu Nez Purse. My father's Howard Gladstone and my mother's Betty Peace Gladstone. Do you mind saying then interpreting any everyday phrase in Blackfeet or uh, for us, your choice. There's one that I just learned and I've been trying to learn it enough that I can just have it at hand. Um, I wanted to say it at the Globes, but I hadn't, I didn't have it then, but I love it. It's um, Robert Hall wrote me and he and I were at University of Montana together. I'm only a couple weeks younger than him, I think, but he's, he's language revitalizationist. I caught up with Robert from his office in the Blackfeet Nation. Oh, and it's too nice and scarce. Uno kai katsis. It's a topi. I'm scarpy peak. And then it's a tapu duck me. It is a master cupist. Tau is the master cat open. It's a book. And it's a nax. So, hello. My name is Robert. I work at our schools where I teach the Blackfoot language and literacy as well. I am very much focused on revitalizing our Blackfoot language. And it's full of, you know, I mean, there's stressful days, but <laughs> there's a lot of loving days. And one of those might have been when he taught Gladstone a new phrase. You know, we're so used to saying when we say thank you, we say the word for like, it's good. So sukapi, it's good, or ik sukapi, it's the best, it's great. He uh, he gave me this word that I really love, and it changes um, a little bit of how I think about gratitude. It's um, nitsika tai kitsip, nitsika tai kitsip, means I feel the good in what you've done. Hotter summers, longer pollen seasons, and record rainfalls. These changing patterns are putting our health and the health of those we love at risk. So, communities around the country are taking steps to prepare. State, local, and tribal health officials are using the Building Resilience Against Climate Effects Framework, developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, called BRACE for short. The five-step process is used to develop strategies and programs that help communities prepare a coordinated community response to the health effects of a changing climate. Step one is identifying what climate effects are relevant locally, how those might lead to new or expanded health threats, and who is most at risk. The next step is to calculate expected impacts on the local population, and then rank the severity of each threat. This is called projecting the disease burden. What it does is it helps health officials tackle the worst risks first. Step three is to identify ways the community can intervene to prevent or reduce health effects. For example, health officials who are expecting more high heat days might consider if it would be more effective to open community cooling centers or to collaborate on housing and development plans to protect vulnerable residents. Then in step four, health officials work with other community sectors to develop and implement their plan. For example, Health officials may work with city planners to reduce the impact of urban heat islands or with broadcast meteorologists to alert people to prepare for extreme weather. Step five is evaluation. Health officials assess the success of their adaptation plans and gather lessons learned to apply for future activities. These five steps in the BRACE framework are designed to be flexible and responsive to local needs. Any community, whether urban, suburban, rural or tribal, can use BRACE to prepare for the local health impacts of a changing climate. To learn more, visit cdc.gov forward slash climate and health. 
In New Mexico, lawmakers just finished their 30-day legislative session. It was a chance to address top priorities in the state, like climate change, crime, and health care. The state is home to 23 tribal nations, including 19 Pueblos, the Navajo Nation, as well as the Hickoria and Muscalero Apache Nations. I spoke with Sean Griswold, the editor of the news organization Source New Mexico, about what wins and losses Native communities had at the legislature. The Tribal Education Trust Fund is something that we will refer to a lot today in our segment, and it's actually something that has been in the making for many years now. So tell us what it is and ultimately what happened to it. Yeah, this year it was brought again by Representative Derek Lente, who's from Sandia Pueblo. He was asking for $100 million to go into a trust fund that would then pay out money to existing tribal education departments, as well as those who are looking to build out their tribal education department systems, with the idea being that all 23 tribal nations in New Mexico will operate their own tribal education department. Now, you need money to do that. And so Lente's proposal was we're going to put $100 million of state revenue, which is flush right now with oil and gas. A lot of that oil and gas is um, you know, coming from lands that are in the public trust, also coming from native lands. And so with that, his idea was let's build this trust. Let's make it into a revenue area where we can generate every year 5% of what we're making off of this will go to all of those um, education departments. Now, Lente's poll has been four years in the making. He's trying to get 23 tribal nations to agree to this principle of not only education ideas, but also distribution of where that like uh, um, wealth of the trust would go towards. Um, last year, he came very, very close to getting it done. He had issues when it came to the equitable concerns from um, uh, different tribal nations about as to how much money would actually be distributed. He addressed those this year, got his bill through bipartisan support, unanimous support through the House of Representatives in Mexico, through various committees, got it to the Senate floor. And ultimately, he chose to pull the bill. Um, he won't give a lot of details as to why that happened, but he does tell us that there was some concerns from one of the tribal interests that came back to the idea of we're not being equitable enough for all for everybody. And so now we're kind of left wondering, like, who in New Mexico wasn't with this bill? Because it had broad support from people who are non-tribal. State government was ready to support it. It was part of New Mexico's record $10.2 billion budget. Um, it got laced down to $50 million, which is half of what Lenti wanted, but it was still there. And at the very last minute, he decided to pull it. And so we're still left with a little bit of like an idea about what that means. Plus, also knowing that we're probably going to be in this education reform issue in New Mexico probably for the rest of our lives. Sean, it sounds like it was a pretty big deal for this legislation to die. What was the reaction like at the Roundhouse in Santa Fe? It was one of those things that like for any reporter in the building who was like watching it was just shocked. And then talking to Representative Lenti afterwards, he himself seemed just stupefied as to why this happened. Mm. You know, bipartisanship, having support from both Democrats and Republicans is something so rare in any lawmaking body in the United States. But this bill had that support. So number one, I think what signals as to why this was supported unanimously is you have a lot of Republicans that are in the minority in New Mexico. Um, they will filibuster bills. They'll talk about so many things that are unrelated to the thing they're talking about. They'll give three, four hours of debate and then eventually lose in the vote. This is one thing they never contested. They were in support of this bill, Republicans, Democrats. It was unanimous support. Up until the point where it got to the Senate floor and Lente decided it wasn't quite there. And what's substantial for that, like I was saying, is that, you know, Representative Lente is, is prominent in the legislature for a number of reasons outside of issues just pertinent to Native American peoples. But him carrying this stuff is also sig signified as to like why he is the person that's supposed to be doing this work. No other Native American legislator was proposing anything like this, has proposed anything like this. Um, there are several Native Americans in the state legislature that that supported it, that are with it. Um, but what Lenti not only did was provide 23 tribes in the state to kind of come to a consensus, at least we thought, to get this bill up to where it was presented in the legislature, but then also got non-Native people to support it in a way that was quite substantial. And back to the point of education reform, something that the state of New Mexico has to do. 
There are a number of pieces of legislation that did pass the New Mexico House and Senate and are now waiting to be signed into law by Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. Are any of those significant in their impact to Native communities? Yeah, there's one in particular that comes through. Um, it's called the Junior Bill, which is, you know, $160,000 to this community, $200,000 to that community, uh, basically communities across New Mexico. It's a space where all lawmakers can find like their pet projects to support. One of the major ones that came out of that, it's a $319 million spending bill going across the state, is that we're going to see $160,000 go towards language programs in Jemez Pueblo. And it was surprising that this was something that was done by outgoing Senator Benny Shendo, um, who's going to be um, going to Boulder to work with the university in Colorado. Um, he was the only Native legislator that was able to get money specific to education that focuses on tribal education initiatives. And that was something that's going to be funded through that program right there. Well, Sean Griswold, editor of Source New Mexico, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for chatting. That is a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.